All right, I'm Chris Nelson with Gaslight Software. Uh, I'm going to be talking about building rich client web apps and CoffeeScript and Rails as much as I can in uh, however much time I have. Um, first of all, how many people are really happy with the design of their JavaScript to the point that it's almost as much fun to code the JavaScript front end of their app as it is to code Ruby? OK, we've got like two, three people. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are not? Okay, good. I'll keep talking then. Otherwise, I was going to sit down. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this was definitely me. Uh, I spent a long time um, trying to figure this out. I actually gave a talk on um, RubyJS a couple years back at RubyConf, which is an attempt to compile Ruby into JavaScript. I've really been searching for like a better way to build my front ends. Um, I guess the first thing to point out is how I, I've normally done it up to this point is basically try to code as much as my app as I can in Rails and then you know sprinkle a little jQuery on as little as I can to make it dynamic as much as I can or as much as I need to. And I've basically found that whole thing to be a, a big fail. Um, my apps need to be richer now and I might as well you know start doing the right way to begin with and this was an attempt to kind of find a better way to do that. Um, I guess before you start doing anything else, are you, how many people are test driving their JavaScript? Okay, this talk is not about that, but if you're not doing that already, just ignore everything else I'm about to say and do that first. Go check out Jasmine, just start doing it. Um, I had to start doing that first before I could get anywhere. Um, so, first point, I, I really dig CoffeeScript. If you haven't seen CoffeeScript yet, go check it out. Um, it's it's not really a completely different language. What it really is, I think, is better syntax for JavaScript. Uh, so I'm going to show a little code there, um, if I can get to it. Oops. Let's get out of that. Oops. Oh. Hello. All right. So I'll show a spec. By the way, my editor here is Redcar, which is awesome. Daniel Lovecraft's right in the front. You can thank him for it. Um, so this is a spec. Um, this is some CoffeeScript. Um, just, I'm not going to try to really go into CoffeeScript too much because um, that would take too long. Um, but briefly, it cures just some of my big annoyances with JavaScript. Um, having to type function so much, just believe it or not, just really bugged the crap out of me. And the CoffeeScript has this really nice syntax here, this um, uh, minus, you know, this little arrow thing to say this is the beginning of a function. Um, CoffeeScript does use significant white space, which I thought would be terrible and awful, but when I started using it, it hasn't bothered me at all. Um, and the thing about CoffeeScript that I think is really awesome, the JavaScript that it compiles into is not like the output of a compiler that's munged and terrible and you can't use it and you can't look at the debugger and figure it out. It's just JavaScript, not that much different than I would write myself. There's some things going on with implicit return statements and stuff that um, make it a little bit different than if I just totally hand coded that spec. But the point is, I can look at it and see what's going on. I can look at it in my debugger and see what's going on. It doesn't get in my way. It just lets me write code that's just much lovelier and nicer to deal with. Where am I at? Okay. So, really did coffee script. Uh, Backbone. Um, Backbone is a really lightweight MVC framework for JavaScript. Um, so, there's a bunch of JavaScript frameworks out there, and what I found with all the ones that I've looked at is uh, they may have come with like lots of features and widgets and stuff that was awesome, but at the end of the day, the code that I had to write to use it made me sad. The code that I used when I started using Backbone made me happy, and I was pleased to deal with it. And I started using Backbone, um, uh, it was, it's, it's been just enough and, and no more. It's like really lightweight, it's just barely an MVC framework. And I used to think that was bad, and it turns out it's good. Having just barely enough is, is really what I want anymore as a developer. Um, so the other thing about Backbone is I sort of started refactoring my way into it, which I really like. Um, 
So I started with my typical app where I had just more and more jQuery in a JavaScript file on the page until it out, got out of control and I was sad and grumpy. And what I did was I took that jQuery and refactored it into a coffee script, or I'm sorry, into a backbone view. Um, and just that little bit of structure, like it, it got me sold on it, it got me hooked. And then I started going from there. Um, again, I'm not gonna have time to like thoroughly go into backbone, that would be like a, a 40 minute talk or something, but I'll just show a little bit of what what views and stuff look like. Um, this is a backbone view. Um, I'm writing all my code in CoffeeScript, of course. Um, uh, I'm writing a class that extends a backbone view. I have this events hash, which maps, okay, you know, somewhere in the element for this view, uh, there's a new base type button, and I'm mapping the click event to the new base type function of this class. And then down in new base type, I can actually do something if you click that button. Um, views don't really give you much out of the box. Um, it's almost like they're a convention. Other than this events hash, there's not much to them other than a convention. Uh, Backbone doesn't mandate a templating framework. I use handlebars. Handlebars is awesome. Uh, I don't have time to go into that either, but it's worth checking out. Um, Down in my render, I'm basically just taking my template and calling the function and putting it on the element for my page. Um, real quick so I don't run out of time, I want to show um, what models look like. Um, so models are what actually do the work. And the thing that I really dig about the backbone models is they just seamlessly worked. If you respond to RESTful JSON in your Rails app, they will basically just work. Um, you basically just get a, uh, you know, you create your model, you call save, and it knows how to do everything else. Uh, it's worth pointing out models are asynchronous. When you call save, you've got to listen to something. I have this particular model uh, set up to, to broadcast a persisted uh, event so that my view can listen to it because it needs to do a couple things when a successful save happens. Um, you get a bunch of lifecycle events and backbone for free, but it wasn't quite what I wanted here, so I made my own here with this persisted kind of event. That was really easy to do too. Um, just, I don't know, I finally feel like I found a way to, to build my front end to my Rails app um, in a rich way that um, I'm really happy with the code. So that's mainly what I wanted to share, and um, I think that's, I think that'll leave me like two minutes for questions. Okay, so yeah, I, I spent a good amount of time trying to dig into Sprout Core, and basically all the code that I've seen there uh, has seemed to like introduce a bunch of complexity that I didn't want, and it seemed to be pretty hard to figure out how to do things I wanted to do, and uh, eventually I gave up. Uh, I, saw, I recently saw like a head-to-head -head backbone to uh, Sprout Core kind of comparison, and it made me think I was still a lot happier with backbone. Yeah, so I've broken all my templates into separate files. I have a helper that pulls my templates in on the Rails side and a companion <coughs> helper that pulls them in on my test side, in my unit tests. And that's been really important and useful for us. But do, you, do, you, do you manage to share the same templates for Rails and for JavaScript? Or do you just render everything in JavaScript? I render everything in JavaScript. So I've basically gone more towards like Rails is going to be like a really pretty thin back end eventually probably Rails for this class of app, maybe not even necessary. Just metal that knew how to speak JSON restfully would be enough, actually. You probably could do that if you're using nostalgia. Nostalgia is a Ruby version of nostalgia. Sure, the style sheet, the CSS is totally, totally shareable. Yeah. Yeah, well, mustache, the template language. Oh, mustache, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Mustache was not good enough for me. Handlebars was what I wanted. I don't know if there's a service to Ruby version of that either, but. Okay, I think we're okay. done. Thanks.
Thank you. Yeah, I do. Okay, so uh, my name is Tom Bedard. Uh, I'm a, a Rails developer by day, but uh, I've been hacking on with sort of graphics, generative graphics programming for a while now. And uh, what I'm going to show you is uh, uh, a real time 3D uh, ray tracer uh, built uh, with WebGL. Uh, so WebGL came, um, uh, had full support in Chrome and Firefox very recently. Um, so what uh, I've done is convert some of the uh, GPU-based ray tracers uh, to work in the browser. Um, and I shall switch to Chrome. OK, so uh, a few, well, it's about six weeks ago, uh, I launched Fractal.io. Uh, so this is a, um, uh, just a, a WebGL-based um, Uh, Fractal Explorer, basically, so we can fly through the the scene and everything's rendered in real time. It's all interactive. Um, okay, so and there's various parameters as well, um, so we can tweak things like uh, so we can change the rotation and and maybe we'll. F oops. Yeah, we we'll, we'll sort of. Zoom in a bit closer. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're kind of, yeah, flying a bit closer. Um, what, what, what it's actually doing is dropping down to low resolution when I'm moving around to, and then it uh, flashes to re render at high resolution. Uh, then we can, we can do things like uh, we can maybe add a bit of fog. Um, Maybe change the color of that as well. Make it a bit, a bit moody or something. Um, so the way the way this is working is uh, it's all running. Uh, there's no geometry here. It's all just a single single quad, uh, which is two triangles basically, uh, six vertices, and everything is done on a GLSL uh, shader, which is the OpenGL shader language. Um, so what you can actually do is, uh, it's basically uber shader. Everything is in here. It's just one shader. So there's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. But it's basically um, uh, conditional compile time uh, blocks for each different type of fractal. And uh, plus all the kind of the ray tracing uh, code in there. The way it works is uh, for each pixel uh, in the scene, you work out a direction vector. So you have a single eye point, And then you, you find a, a coordinate from the eye point to that, the coordinate of the pixel. That gives you a direction vector. And then uh, you iteratively step into the scene from this direction, in, in this direction. At each step, you run the fractal uh, calculation, which uh, the result of which gives you uh, the distance to the nearest surface in any direction. I've got one, one slide I can show you to help illustrate that. So you've got an eye point. Um, what, what the dotted line there is the nearest uh, uh, surface, uh, so you know that you can step forward by that amount before hitting, uh, hitting anything. And so you can step forward and then you do the same process again and again. Um, so this is, a, this is a technique that's been used a lot on the demo scene to create these four, 4K uh, sort of uh, uh, crazy demos. Um, and then you keep stepping forward until the distance to the surface is below a threshold, at which point you know you're within uh, a limit to hit the surface. And uh, at that point, you can uh, then calculate the normal vector. Uh, once you've got the normal vector, you can uh, do the shading calculations. And there's, a, there's, other, um, there's other parameters here. So we can um, go to speed a bit later. You have to kind of slow it, oops. <laughs> slow it down a bit when you get close to the surface, because it gets a bit out, out of control. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so, so you can play, play around within your browser. It'll work in Firefox 4 uh, or Chrome, latest Chrome. Um, there's a fractal library here. Um, so we've got different, uh, we've got the kind of the classic uh, uh, manga uh, cube here, manga sponge. Um, but then there's, there's, a diff there's all sorts of different uh, styles of 3D fractals. So uh, it was actually late 2009 when um, this kind of collaborative effort by a group of amateur and professional mathematicians on fractal forums that 
uh, some guys work on trying to find a true uh, 3D analog of the Mandelbrot set. Um, so this is, uh, this is called the Mandelbulb, um, which is uh, kind of what resulted. Um, and it's the closest thing to, to a 3D equivalent of uh, the classic Mandelbrot. Um, so yeah, it gets a little tricky to control uh, here. Um, but then that sort of opened the floodgates to uh, a whole new breed of 3D fractals. Um, so there's one called the uh, Mandel Box, which is um, a slightly different, uh, different take. Uh, basically what's happening here is you're doing, for each point, you're doing a series of uh, scaling, uh, reflections, uh, rotations, and uh, applied iteratively, uh, you, you get these, these crazy shapes. Um, so it's another example. So we can, um, we can sort of fly into this structure. And the closer you get, uh, the more detail is revealed. But obviously, the trickier it gets to uh, control, so we can slow it down a little bit. Um, I, think, I think running in dual monitor mode might not be helping the graphics card. Um, it is actually possible to completely lock up your computer here with the graphics card uh, um, if you push it too, too far. Um, so you have to be careful. But this is, uh, yeah, you can, you can spend literally hours exploring this, <laughs> as I have done many an evening. Um, so uh, what are the examples? Yeah, it's, it's quite, uh, yeah, you can get some quite sort of crazy organic uh, shapes as well. Um, this is uh, uh, it's called a kaleidoscopic IFS, iterative function system uh, algorithm. And um, by tweaking various, uh, let's see, various parameters, you can get a whole mixture of sort of organic and uh, uh, sort of natural shapes. So uh, to finish off, what I want to do is uh, just show you a quick uh, little animation. Um, so the, the uh, GLSL shader that uh, Fractal Lab is derived from is something that I was working on um, for a, an After Effects plugin. And this is, uh, this is a video that's actually playing in Times Square at the moment in one of the uh, kiosks.
Okay, that's it. Hi everybody, um, my name is Jason Nealon, I'm a developer at Forward. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, sort of experience we've had over the last year and a half, two years, um, working on a, a system that comprised, a, a lot of it was like a Windows application written in .NET. And we moved to Ruby and we had to do some interesting kind of, I would think sort of novel things to, to get that to, to work. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, this is a uh, use switch for business. So it's an energy switching <coughs> site for businesses. Um, there isn't very much going on, on the website. You just uh, capture some uh, contact details for a person. Uh, and then it goes through to our call center in Camden. Um, and, th and these guys then ring that person back and, um, and switch their energy, which requires capturing like a whole lot of information about them. Um, so we built this system about a year and a half ago um, so that using WPF. Um, and, you know, it, it, it worked out okay, it was, it was fine. Um, but then at the start of last year, uh, we were, uh, became part of Forward. And Forward's very much like a Ruby, a Ruby sort of development shop. Um, and as, as I guess you guys would know, you can get a lot more done with Ruby. So for us, we didn't want to continue on doing .NET stuff because of like the additional complexity of having two completely separate platforms. And we just, we just knew that we would get more done uh, using uh, Ruby, Ruby tools and, and, uh, and uh, you know, that whole stack. Um, so the, the question for us was, you know, well, you know, how do you use Ruby with, with like Windows? We had no idea, really. So uh, first thing we looked at was uh, Iron Ruby. So Iron Ruby is um, Microsoft's implementation of Ruby on the .NET framework. Um, that didn't work out very well. It was just too much hassle, we found. Um, for a start, uh, a lot of the popular gems that we wanted to use didn't work very well or just uh, displayed weird behavior, especially when at any point where they were interacting with like a uh, Win32 system. Um, another big problem at, at that specific point, I think it's a bit better now, was that the uh, actual WPF framework, the, the Windows framework that we were using, didn't interact correctly with the Iron Ruby objects. And for us as well, it was just like, how we're gonna to have to install this Iron Ruby thing on everyone's machines, and it was extra pain. So rather than doing this, which I, which I would call like in-process integration, we kind of took a very different uh, approach, which was to basically develop web apps in Ruby on, you know, running on Ubuntu, completely separate applications that, that we would then, you know, integrate with the Windows application. Um, so I guess another thing to mention is that we weren't like on my team, we didn't have a lot of Ruby experience, so we kind of started at, at the edge with this sort of application, which was just like a load of, a load of prices in and a CSV. So it was like probably the simplest sort of uh, you know, Ruby app you could get going with. That was the first thing we did. So uh, then we went on to doing like things like reports, because that, that's, uh, that's a good thing to do on the web anyway, you know, because we knew all the technologies, you know, like uh, Google, Google reports and stuff like that. But that was kind of a safe place where we could uh, you know, get up to speed on Ruby and um, you know, you know, uh, basically mess around and get our heads around Ruby and, and do stuff. Um, we, did, we did create a bit of a mess. Um, we had to go back and rewrite some of them once we became you know, a bit more experienced, but uh, you know, no, nobody died. It was like a safe place to, to start. Um, one horrible thing was uh, ODBC. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows about ODBC. You know, it's probably it's years since I heard of it, but if you want to get Ruby to talk to a uh, Microsoft SQL Server database, uh, that's what you're going to have to use. Um, and even worse than that, we had three environments with ODBC. So we, had, we were developing on Macs. Uh, so that was one ODBC connection to set up. Then on the Windows boxes, there was another sort of ODBC connection. And then, then there was you know, the Ubuntu environment that we were deploying onto. 
Um, and there's lots of weird bugs would happen where uh, true and false would come back as zero and one and reports wouldn't work. So at, th at this point, uh, we, we migrated everything to MySQL and uh, everything became a lot smoother after that. Like another thing we did in that process was change all our database namings to be, uh, you know, sort of uh, active record compliant and stuff like that. Uh, and once, once we run MySQL, a lot of pain went away. So, you know, if you're feeling pain like that using SQL Server, the, the message is just get away from it. Um, so at, at this point, we were kind of uh, wanting to do a bit of closer integration with the Windows application, um, but still, you know, do, do web apps. Um, so the obvious solution to that, you know, if you were doing, if you had two web apps, you would just use hyperlinking, right? And you can kind of do the same thing um, with a Windows application. If you think of like iTunes and Spotify, uh, if you go to, if you go to, you can get a link to a Spotify song and it just opens up the Spotify app on your machine. So we did, we did exactly that. We created our own uh, protocol. Uh, you run a little Windows application and then you can basically do RSS feeds and any web app with a link into the Windows application. Because we, we, we didn't really want to like spend three months rewriting or six months rewriting a Windows application that we've sort of just done. So um, that, that was quite good. Like integration wasn't seamless from a UI perspective, but it was good enough. So uh, that worked out quite well. Um, another approach was to uh, write sort of small little web services in Sinatra. Um, you wouldn't really do the same thing in .NET because like you have to write so much code. I don't know, this is like, this is our, this is like one of many files that you end up having to write in .NET uh, to, to expose like some JSON or XML. But whereas like with Sinatra, it's like really straightforward. So we had like ra lots of random data sources uh, <laughs> that we had to, um, that we had to, that the business wanted to use. So we would write a Sinatra app that would, uh, um, you know, return that as JSON or we might write a simple web interface for it. And then later on, we would sort of integrate that more closely with Windows application with some like asynchronous sort of client or something like that. Um, so after a while, we, as another thing we started doing was sort of basically writing uh, Rails or, or this is a Rails app or Sinatra apps and then just basically cramming them in an Internet Explorer uh, plugin inside in the um, Windows application. So to sum up, yeah, uh, starting at the edge worked for us. In process integration was really painful. You, you might get on better, but we didn't. Uh, HTTP integration was great. And doing things incrementally was a win because we didn't have people uh, you know, complaining that we weren't doing anything or we weren't delivering anything visible. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Any, any questions? Yep. Um, I had good luck using uh, JRuby in SQL Server, oddly enough, because the okay. JDBC driver is pretty solid. I don't know if you guys checked that out. Or um, I, I think. Uh, JRuby seems to have a lot more support and be like we, we are using JRuby on another project in our company and it seems a lot more solid than Iron Ruby is. Um, oh, yeah, yeah I, I think like Microsoft just kind of basically dumped Iron Ruby recently. So yeah, now it's up. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. Right. We did, uh, yeah. Thanks very much. I'll make it quick. You make it quick. Yeah, it's all green, bright. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a gem I wrote a few months ago called Crapshoot. It's for rolling dice. So if you're a nerd and you play Dungeons and Dragons, uh, you're probably familiar with some of these codes. 2d4 rolls two four-sided dice. 1d100 plus eight rolls a hundred-sided die plus eight. 46V, that's a little invention we had. It rolls four six-sided dice and then gets rid of the lowest die. That's a language. It's an actual programming language. It expresses computations very precisely for human communication. It's also a regular language, which can be accepted by a regular expression, 
can be accepted by a deterministic finite state machine, which is what regexes are compiled to, and it can be generated by a regular grammar. So this is a complicated dice language statement. It's an expression. This is a binary expression. This first one is a series. It's a series of dice rolls. This is an arithmetic operator, and this is a constant. It's, it's a 100% certified Web 2.0 regular language. <laughs> I, I implemented it in Regal, which compiles a state machine from a .rl file into a bunch of weird languages and Ruby. So this is the actual language implementation as it was a couple months ago. I added a few stuff today. The uh, Regal file is 62 lines. The Ruby it generates is, I think, today about 400 lines. And it also produces a PDF if you want to you know, go at it with a pen and paper and make sure it works. So what I want to do with this Regal is turn all these strings into a bunch of token objects representing constant series and arithmetics. Each token has an eval method that actually turns it into a result, so a constant just returns itself. It has an independent method to see if it's an operator and it depends on the next one to the list. And it has an inspect operator to look nice. So I've parsed a bunch of tokens, and now I have a uh, infix notation math. But infix is a pain. It's, uh, people are, are great at it, but computers, it's more complicated to write software to do it. So what I really want is a postfix representation so I can just munch down a stack, like in uh, PostScript, the printer language. So I take this, and I basically rearrange the operators to do that. So for a series, I can then just roll the dice, push the result onto the stack. For a constant, push it onto a stack. Arithmetic, pop twice, push the result. So I start with this. I get 15 on my dice. That goes onto the stack. I roll 3d10, get 5, goes onto the stack. I see a plus, I add those, and it gets a 20 onto the stack. 2d6, that comes up 9, goes onto the stack. Minus goes onto the stack and then returns 11. 300 evaluates to itself, goes onto the stack. Minus, get minus 289. So uh, your fighter or wizard is dead. <laughs> the, uh, this morning, I added operator precedence, which is harder than no operator precedence. And operators that aren't as important as multiplication or division, like plus and minus, get pushed onto a stack during the post-fixing part of it. There's a web version of this online optimized for Dungeons and Dragons players at uh, triskelion.heroku.com. The source is on GitHub. It's, uh, it doesn't have multiplication and division yet because network access has been spotty today. Uh, if you want to fork it, there's a GitHub. It's bcurly slash crapshoot. But again, today's stuff isn't on there. The crapshoot gem also hasn't been updated yet. Uh, thanks. Any quick questions? Uh, I use it on the desktop because we also have like tons of PDF books that we have to reference. And if we're doing it remotely, we can talk over Skype too. Okay. Any more questions? Ask me later. Thanks very much. Yeah, okay. thanks for the Oz, Super guys. Lightning <laughs> Super lightning talk. All right. Um, I started programming on a TI-83+. Plus. Did anybody else do something similar? No there are no slides. <laughs> the presentation is here, and it looks good <laughs> to some people. OK, sorry. Um, so I started programming on a calculator. Um, Maybe some other people did. Uh, this talks about kids' Ruby. So um, I'm not reading. Uh, there's not enough programmers in the world. The best programmers all started when young. <laughs> the computer <coughs> programming education budgets are getting slashed in the US slash UK and elsewhere. I think we all know that, right? Mm. 
and why the lucky stiff. He cared a lot about teaching kids. He created Hackety Hack. But Hackety Hack is showing its age. It doesn't actually run like normal Ruby code like puts. <laughs> so most kids hackers actually want to write things like 100 dot times do puts my teacher sucks. <laughs> End. Because that's easier than writing actually a hundred times on the board, like, I will not do this over and over. Or they just want to create games, and um, basically Kids Ruby is real Ruby. So um, it provides a simple editor, just imagine it. On the left side is the editor, and the right side is the output. Um, so it's really easy, you just turn it on, and it's kind of like the old, old style TRS-80 Commodore 64. You guys might have used that. Um, it's written in Ruby and JavaScript, so it's pretty easy to hack on. I actually hacked on it, and I'm not that good at programming. So if I can do it, you guys should do it, too. Um, it's compatible with some code samples of Hackity Hack, which is kind of interesting. And um, it's also like the, I don't know if you guys have played with Hackity Hack. Yeah, Hackity Hack. All right, uh, there's that turtle thing. You guys know about the turtle? So there's support for that, um, which is really cool for kids. Um, it also uh, has an interface to go to. Uh, it's a 2D gaming library, which is, you guys probably heard about that earlier in one of the talks. And um, we need people's help. So um, all sorts of things. There's, there's classes set up. Is anybody going to RailsConf? Yeah, yeah. Really? All right, cool. So. There's going to be some classes there, so look out for that. And um, yeah, we need help with like the editor and curriculum, um, HTML. That's pretty much it. Uh, so if you're actually interested in seeing it, I would show it, but it would blow you guys away. <laughs> and my talk would be in vain if I, if I didn't show it, so just come see me after. This might be very short because this might just fail. We'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Oops. Cool. Oops. Okay. Hey, that's good. Good start. Okay, so yeah. Uh, start at the end, shall we? Uh, awesome. Yeah. Cool. So I was going to talk to you um, about robots very quickly. Um, my name's John. I work for Forwards uh, with the other two guys. This has been my experience so far of uh, this, uh, this Ruby conference. Um, I prepared this talk a few weeks ago, and then I found out there's this amazing Arduino robot that Pete, that's going to be shown tomorrow, which goes underwater. So um, I was going to demonstrate this little guy very quickly. Uh, it's a little Arduino robot, which uh, you guys are hopefully going to be able to control um, during this talk. So if I quickly plug it in. Um, so yeah, bear with me. Uh, this, this might totally fail. So the idea was to um, build a robot, uh, show it off to you guys here. Um, my motivation is uh, robots are awesome. It's the first law of software development. Um, <laughs> so uh, we wanted to, to have a two-way interaction with the robot, so uh, we wanted you guys to be able to use it. So we needed something that was uh, highly consistent, highly available, um, with a very low latency. So of course we chose Twitter, um, <laughs> which is another reason why this might be disastrously wrong. So I'm going to plug this robot in. Uh, if you want to tweet at FWD bots, it's got commands forwards, backwards, left, right, and dance, and hopefully we'll see something cool. Uh, so uh, if you guys, I'll just quickly throw this down here. It was going to be wireless, but I didn't have time to build the wireless adapter for it. So uh, let me just start up this guy. That should be in. And if we, whoops. 
Oh, dear. Oh, ah, oh, fail. <laughs> it's because I've been playing with it. <laughs> there we go. Oh, oh, it's. That's the. Uh, my bad. I think I plugged it into the uh, wrong one. Fingers crossed. There we go. Cool. So it'll pick up your tweets that reply to you. Um, if you're interested in how it works, I can either go through it in the pub or we can quickly talk about it now. Um, it's a little Arduino, which is an open source prototyping uh, platform, which has got a little microcontroller on it. Um, the idea is you program it in a language which is like C. It's actually called the Arduino programming language, which is based on a language called wiring. Um, so we don't really want to program it in C, ideally. So there are other bindings. Um, there's this thing called sing-along Arduino, which um, is uh, the idea is there's a C program on the Arduino, which then you can uh, write Ruby, which is interpreted. So you can essentially just write Ruby code. don't have to, to build it or anything, which is great. Um, fortunately, it's not very good with Macs. It works primarily on Ubuntu, so didn't really get on with it. There's the uh, Ruby Arduino development framework, uh, which you write Ruby code. It gets compiled down into, uh, into C. Um, that's pretty cool too, and we're going to hear a talk tomorrow about Mac Ruby. Um, but uh, I didn't do any of that. I, I wrote a C program which interprets serial data, which is sent across this, this uh, USB connection here. Um, so it essentially sends commands which deserialize in C using the Twitter gem and the serial port gem. Um, it was really simple. The motivation behind this talk was to show you that you don't need to be like a super brain to build a robot. It's really straightforward. It took me a few hours in my 10% time. So while these guys were saving consumers loads of money, um, I was messing around with this. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, essentially, yeah, there's a root program which just searches Twitter. Um, and whenever it finds a tweet at FWDBot, it'll broadcast it uh, onto the Arduino. Um, the Arduino will then decode the signal and then translate it into a motor signal. Um, change some voltages on some pins. That's pretty straightforward. That's essentially it. Any questions? Cool. We should go to the pub. Full party.